Hello and welcome to the fourth of the five videos on x-ray interpretation from Teach Me Anatomy. So as usual I would like to thank X-Ray 2000 for the use of some images and also refer anyone watching this video to teachmeanatomy.info for more information. Can't cover everything within these videos um, they're fairly rapid considering what has to be covered and they're very basic um, designed mainly for people in the early years of a medical course. So this video will be on the pelvis, the hip joint and the femur. So here we see an AP view of a pelvis. So you tend to get an AP and a lateral view for the pelvis of the hip or of the hip joint um, but you can have just an AP view in some circumstances so um, if you're in clinical placement or if you're shown an image um, there may not necessarily be a lateral in some cases so we see here normal anatomy we have the iliac crests the sacroiliac or SI joints between the sacrum and the iliac crests. We have the acetabulum, the cup of the ball and socket joint, so this is the socket, the acetabulum, and then the femoral head, the femoral neck, the greater trochanter, and the lesser trochanter, which you can see here, greater lesser. You can also see the superior and inferior pubic rami, singular being ramus, which uh, can also be fractured, but I, I won't uh, have any images of that in this video. We have the pubic symphysis, or the symphysis pubis, where the two sides of the pelvis articulate. And we have the obturator foramen. Now, an important thing with uh, a pelvic pelvic X-ray is the difference between the male and female anatomy. So here we have a female pelvis. Here is a male pelvis, and if we compare them side by side, we can see, for example, two main differences: a more acute pubic angle in the male, a more obtuse pubic angle in the female, and a more flared iliac crest in the male. The female pelvis appears generally more broad, sort of more spread out, I suppose is a good way to think of it. If you are really struggling to tell the difference between a male and female pelvis x-ray, um, do bear in mind that certain things create a soft tissue shadow. I'll uh, leave it to yourselves to work out what I'm referring to. So another thing to consider with the pelvis is that it is made up of free bones. So we see here in an AP pelvis of a 14 month old baby that the bones of the pelvis are not yet fused like they are in an adult. You see here the bones of the pelvis completely fused, but here in the child we have a separated ilium, ischium and, pu ischium and pubis, the free bones of the innominate bone as it's known, which is sort of the, the hemipelvis. And we can also see that the femoral head isn't fused in young children. And so we've covered the AP view, this is a lateral view of the hip, and it can be quite confusing to look at. It is an excellent view for differentiating in which direction fracture fragments are going, um, or the direction of a dislocation. So this image shows a labelled diagram which hopefully is fairly clear on your screen 
Uh, A, we have the femoral head. B, the femoral neck. C, the greater trochanter. D, the shaft of the femur. E is the lesser trochanter. And F is the ischial tuberosity. And knowing that F is the ischial tuberosity and that the ischial tuberosity is posterior is a good way to orientate yourself. So if you were just to look at this x-ray here, you know that that is posterior, that's the ischial tuberosity. And if the ball of the ball and socket joint, because here we see the sockets, those arrows point to the acetabulum. If that ball is this way, you know it's a posterior dislocation, for example. So I think that one of the most common things you will tend to see on an AP view of the pelvis is osteoarthritis. So I've discussed osteoarthritis in previous videos. Here we see quite grubby looking joints really. Not the most medical way to describe it, but you can tell. You have some subchondral sclerosis, some osteophytic changes, generally not pretty looking joints and probably fairly painful. So a good symptomatic surgery which is performed for this is a total hip replacement, which can be seen here, where both the ball and the socket are replaced. So they whip out the femoral head, put in this metal prosthesis, and they replace the acetabulum itself with a plastic cup. Um, and that's fairly regular surgery to see. So on to fractures. So especially around, say, winter time, it's icy. You tend to get a lot of elderly ladies, especially, um, taking a tumble. And due to various factors, including osteoporosis, they are more likely to get fractured neck of femurs. So here we see um, what I would describe as an intracapsular fractured neck of femur. Um, at this stage, early on in the course, since these are basic x-ray videos, um, I would say the main important thing to understand is that there are two sort of general classifications of a neck of femur fracture, and these are intracapsular, like this. So you can see, hasn't crossed the intratrochanteric line, and fractures like this, which are extracapsular. You can see a lucent line running through here, and that's extracapsular. And the important thing to know about a fracture being intra and extracapsular comes down to the anatomy, and Basically, in the hip, you have a ligament to the head of the femur, which is a branch of the obturator artery. It comes in about here. And this branch of the obturator artery, or artery to the head of the femur, um, supplies a reasonable amount of blood in children, but by the time you're an adult, it's shriveled to next to nothing. So the main actual blood supply to the hip joint or to the head of the femur is through the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries which come from the deep artery of the thigh usually. So they run around and up like this and send little arteries up through the capsule into the head. So you can imagine that in this circumstance here these arteries will be disrupted and because there's pretty much no blood supply from here, in an adult femoral head, what can result is a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. So, just to recap, intracapsular fracture, danger of a vascular necrosis, extracapsular fracture, less danger of avascular necrosis because you've, you've still got that blood supply maintained. And so this difference also influences the treatment. So again, there are more nuances to this, but at a basic level, uh, an intracapsular fracture will necessitate 
this, a hemiarthroplasty, which is where just the head, not the acetabulum in this case, just the head has been replaced with a metal prosthesis um, due to the danger that trying to heal the fracture any other way will result in a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. The femoral head will basically just waste away and especially in an elderly patient that will result in um, a terrible circumstance of being immobile in hospital for prolonged periods of time and can result in you know very high statistical mortality so they plump for this option rather than running the risk for an elderly patient with an intraarticular intracapsular sorry intra intracapsular fracture so in the extracapsular fracture um, there's less risk of the AEVN, so they can use something called a dynamic hip screw, which looks like this. So that's a DHS. You can also get fractures uh, in younger people, and these can be due to generally two main causes, which are due to a pathological reason, so a pathological fracture. So here we see uh, a malignancy in the bone and this weakness has allowed a fracture to happen probably through fairly trivial force and these malignant areas tend to be in infratrochanteric so just below the trochanters and then the second reason is sort of trauma so road traffic accidents etc can also get dislocations in the pelvis so here you see the left hip just doesn't look quite right compared to the right and there's something called Shenton's line which you can follow round like this and if we go to the left hand side it is disrupted and also we can see here's the cup of the acetabulum and you notice that the shadow of the femoral head is overlapping it and in this case that's because it's dislocated posteriorly so here is another image of a posterior dislocation a bit more clear you can see the head here and here's the socket and it's not in the socket it's dislocated and a posterior dislocation is the most common uh, direction for a femoral head dislocation and tends to be again from uh, some form of trauma and can cause damage for example to the sciatic nerve. A good clinical difference between a fractured neck of femur and a dislocated femoral head is that they, in both cases the limb will be shortened so you'll look at the person lying in the bed and one leg will be shorter than the other. Uh, the difference being in a fractured femoral neck the limb will be externally rotated, the toes will be pointing outwards whereas in a dislocation it will be medially rotated, so toes pointing inwards. And here we have another example of a common reason for a dislocation, um, sort of uh, a complication of total hip replacement can be a dislocation. Uh, another thing you may see in an AP pelvis are metastases, so here's lots of little sclerotic lesions seen all over this pelvis and uh, I suspect these are from uh, prostate cancer because prostate uh, cancer in bone in bone metastases tends to be sclerotic rather than lytic. Sclerotic meaning it's all white rather than black. So now on to the femoral shaft itself. Uh, not too much to comment on here in a basic video but you can get uh, traumatic femoral shaft fractures, often very nasty, in high impact trauma such as road traffic accidents as I mentioned earlier. In this case, not only is there a comminuted fracture of the femoral shaft, there's also a fracture through the acetabulum and into the pubic symphysis. So not very nice at all. And here we see a good example of what we call a butterfly fragment. Uh, so that is the 
hip joint, pelvis and femur. Uh, very basic and I've tried not to ramble too much. This video is getting very long so I have to kind of end there. Um, as usual, if you have any feedback, please pass it on to teachmeanatomy.info and if you'd like to uh, have anything else covered, if I have neglected something that you feel is important, please let us know. Um, while looking for images for this video, I stumbled across something and I think I'll just share it before I finish. So I found this x-ray. I think you may be able to spot the abnormality no matter how new you are to this. Uh, I will, can only wonder how and probably also why, but there you are then. So thank you again and um, hope you enjoyed the video.